So in previous video, I injected first program into a STM32 microcontroller and hooked it up to this little display and it shows some numbers. And it works great, but it could be better. So let's see what we can do here. In previous video, I explained that 7 segment display has 4 inputs and 8 outputs. In total it's 12 pins, but we use only 11 because we don't need a dot. But hooking everything up straightforward to a microcontroller uses a lot of resources. So I used 74LS47 chip, which is simply binary to a 7 segment decoder. And it saved 3 pins for us. However, our input pins are still pretty straightforward. And actually we can optimize this. We can use 74LS149 to be the multiplexer, which would help us to switch digits one by one depending on 2-bit combination. Here is some basic knowledge about this chip. So we have two D multiplexers in one chip, which means we are going to use only half. The first pin is used for enabling the multiplexer and the others are just controls, like A and B is our bits we are going to inject and the others will be switching on one by one, depending on the combination here. Here's our circuit we are going to build today. All this part is not going to change. This is 74LS47, our STM32, and the upgrade is 74LS139, which I was talking about. Before the upgrading, I want to rebuild everything from scratch because, uh, first of all, the current circuit takes two boards and I would like to make it a little bit more compact. And second, I think you would like to see how I'm building it. The yellow wires will connect 7 segment decoder and the display. Later, I will put some orange wires to connect the multiplexer. And this is pretty much what we need at the beginning. This circuit would perfectly work, but uh, now we'll start improving it. First of all, I think it's worth to simply test our 74LS139. So let's hook it up pretty quick and connect a few LEDs for visuals. Uh, so as you can see, something is happening, but uh, not exactly what we wanted, right? Actually, our chip is pulling all outputs high, except one. Look, I'll give it value one. And here it is. The second LED is off. Now, two. The third LED is off. And uh, the fourth LED is off. So actually, everything is working pretty well, but uh, quite an opposite way. And this is the consequence of reading datasheets carelessly. What I missed here is the truth table which shows all possible combinations. And as you can see, upon one 2-bit combination, three outputs are going high and only one is going low. Instead of three bits going low and only one going high. The simple solution to our problem is simply to invert our outputs. And we'll use simple hex inverter 74LS04 to do the job for us. Let's hook this bastard up. I think I messed up a little bit. Here's the place for my chip. Alright, let's hook up our LEDs and see what happens. So the first combination works perfectly, let's just test the others. So. If I give you one, all right, if I give you two, nice, and three, here we go. Our circuit is almost finished, now it's just time to connect these signals to our 7 segment display. All right, time for the final test. Okay, here we go. We have lights on. Let me hook everything and let's see. So, this is the first, second, the third, and the fourth. Nice. Well, everything works just perfectly. Time to build in our microcontroller here and uh, change program a little bit. Actually, while troubleshooting, I noticed that I forgot a couple of wires here. 
You see there are only five yellow wires which are connected to a seven segment decoder. There should be seven. So this is where we ended in the previous episode and uh, we had these two variables which I didn't use yet. But today I'm going to use them and first of all let me rename them somehow like uh, 7 segment digit and then just uh, digit and I will make them as global. I am totally not sure if I am putting them in the right place. There are so many comments here. Let's give these variables some values. So this digit is going to define which 7 segment display digit is going to be active. In other words, I will probably want it to be a 16. And this is going to be our display number. Let's copy it right here and make it, well, whatever. Let's say the same as it was. Now let's leave our while loop as clean as possible and for that purpose I will make additional function which will do the job. And here I'll make some simple map for our setup. And here's the result. The function is a little bit clumsy but it works pretty fine and you can see display flashing. So what I did here, well first two lines is pure math. The very first line contains power function from CMath library and in the second line there is a variable which contains information about our digit we are going to display. So that first part of clumsy math is just for extraction of our digit from our data. And then I added that variable 7 segment digit to show, which is equal to 16, if you remember. The reason for that 16 to even exist is, well, our pins 4 and 5 are directly connected to the multiplexer. And we multiply 16 by value from 0 to 3, which gives 4 different combinations. This is how we choose which digit in our 7 segment display is going to be active. And bits from 0 to 3 just contain information about the number itself. The third line is the most important one. For sure there is nothing connected to port A except our 7 segment display, but what if there is? Well obviously bits from 6 to 15 are going to contain some important information, and if we simply write in our code that our port is now equal to some kind of value, we will lose that information. Well in third line we take precautions and go around the problem by using masking method. Let's see what is exactly happening here. As I said, bits from 6 to 15 may contain some important information in future. They are displayed as X. Capital A and B plus A, B, C and D contain information for our display. And these 6 bits are the only ones we want to change. What we do first, we take the opposite of first 6 bits and use AND operator with port A. And the result is, first 6 bits are 0, the rest is untouched. Then we take mask for our 6 bits and use AND operation with our variable B, which contains information about digit we are going to display. The result is that first 6 bits contain information and the rest are 0. And finally we combine both new values into a single one by using OR operator. And the result is 16 bit number which has only first 6 bits changed. And the rest of the code is just incrementing i from 0 to 3 in order to change digits in our display. However we can still improve something. Yep, it's all cool, we have the single function which does all the work for us, but we also have this delay function. And if you check it out you will see that it's simply decrementing a number. The meaning is that we are just wasting resources and time, which we could use for calculations or other operations. So uh, how can I get rid of these delays? Well, there is a solution and I will show the concept pretty quick. So our microcontroller has built-in timers. Probably every single microprocessor has this feature built in. And what these timer counters do, well, they simply increment themselves with every clock pulse. And their incrementation does not depend on what processor is actually doing right now. And we can use these timers for do periodic tasks without delays. Let me show how it works. So here we go, we have our main function here and it does the job. Meanwhile, timer counter is incrementing itself and it has a compare value register and once these two values in timer counter and uh, that compare value register are the same, the interrupt event happens and our main function is getting paused and the whole process jumps to event handler, which can be configured by us. We can write commands there. So the interrupt happens, the interrupt handler is called, the counter is being reset and once the function is complete, we return to our main routine. So let's see what exactly do we need in order to make this thing work. 
Fine, so I chose general purpose timers for this job and uh, let's see what they have here. Well, first of all, our timer is kinda peripheral as well as our outputs and inputs, so we will have to enable it by editing peripheral clock enable register. So let's see, timer two is right here, so we will simply add value of one to this register. There are three registers which will determine how often our timer will generate an interrupt event. Basically we have counter register which just increments with every clock pulse. Another register is our prescalar register which determines a division factor. Basically if there is something written in prescalar which is not 1, then our counter register is going to increment slower. An auto reload register will contain a value which counter register has to reach. Next one is timer control register. We will have to enable our timer here, but first of all we will have to make sure that it is disabled so we will be able to configure it. We'll do this by injecting an opposite value of 1 with an equal sign. Now what I saw in forums and in general people doing is resetting our timer before doing the other configurations, so I guess I'll do the same. To do so we'll have to use this RCC APB1 RST or register and uh, set the first bit as 1 and then as 0. Now here we will have auto reload and prescaler registers but I will skip them for now just write them down. Next register is event generation register which will allow us to reinitialize our counter every time overflow occurs. So here we will need a bit 0 again. Then we have to enable interrupt for this timer. Again bit 0 which is uh, update interrupt enable. So let's write it down pretty quick. And I think we can finally enable our timer by writing 1 into CR1 register. And now time for prescaler and auto reload registers. Well, what do we have here? First of all, prescaler. As far as I know, my microcontroller is working on 8 MHz oscillator and this number is not very convenient, so I will reduce 8 MHz to just 1 kHz by typing 8000 in my prescaler. That means that our clock will give 8000 clock pulses and only then our counter register will increment by 1. So what the value should be here now? Well, basically I think in order to not distinguish when the LED is blinking, you have to set it on 50 Hz or something. But we have 4 digits blinking here, so I will give 2 Hz, that means that it takes 5 milliseconds. And now there's one more thing I forgot. Sadly, I couldn't figure out what these functions exactly do. What I know is that they configure registers called nested vector interrupt controller. However, these registers are not mentioned in a reference manual. You have to go to another reference manual and it's still kinda wishy-washy for me. So I maybe study this later, but I don't think it's necessary to do this this time. Basically what we do here is we enable interrupt request handler and set the priority. Now every time overflow event occurs, this function runs, which I wrote right here. What we do here is we configure status register for our timer 2. As you can see, we set 0 to bit 1. So we just manually reset this flag as our interrupt event already occurred. And then we just do all that display thing. So let's upload our code. And here we go. It works again. So now let's set another timer which will change the value we are displaying. So we had this play number right here, now we'll have it 0, and what I will try to do is to increment it every second. And yeah boy, it works! And finally I can add some data or something, like uh, not just random numbers or just seconds counting, but actually do some measurement here. And this is what I am going to do in the next video. So for now, thank you so much for watching, I hope you liked it, and uh, I will see you in the next video. And actually, if you go back, you can see how much time I needed just to record this conclusion.